Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Voluntary Contrarian Podcast. My name is Jared Norton. Today is March 4th, 2019. And today I've got a great guest. His name is Shane Radliff. He is the host of the Bonu Podcast with uh, his co-host Kyle Reardon. He is the owner-operator of libertyunderattack.com. And he basically is, has his hands in a lot of things. So how are you doing today, Shane? Hey, I'm doing um, doing well, man. I appreciate the uh, the invitation to come on and chat. Of course, of course. So tell me, um, how long have you been doing your podcast, and what kind of got you to kind of make that leap into sharing what you know and and your passions? Sure, sure. So I started, uh, I guess, uh, I started Liberty Air Attack Radio back uh, February eighth, in two, uh, two thousand fifteen. Um, but I guess before that, it would have been probably 2013 or 2014, uh, was, uh, when I started the, the website, libertyunderattack.com. And, uh, basically that was right when I got into politics for the sit for the short six months that I did. I voted once and, uh, uh, you know, did, uh, just, uh, I guess two, th two, me I guess two, uh, uh, two two attempts at political crusading, and then uh, realized that politics was uh, was not right for me. Uh, it wasn't going to provide me freedom or anything. Uh, so I had libertyattack.com and really didn't do anything with it for a while. Um, basically, just I, I don't know, maybe a few times a year, I'd you know just feel like writing something or or something along those lines. Never got any views on the site. Never really tried anything with it. But uh, I guess it would have been mid 2014 when uh, I got pretty. Uh, you know, pretty active in, uh, you know, uh, researching conspiracies, things like Bill Cooper. I went through my Alex Jones phase, like I'm pretty sure a lot of people did. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, I, I was always very kind of uh, timid. Uh, I remember the first first time I was doing a YouTube video, I was horrified. Um, the YouTube channel came a little before the, uh, before the radio show. And uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, I, and honestly, uh, looking back, I guess, uh, uh, four, uh, four years ago, uh, I had no idea what I was talking about then. Uh, none whatsoever. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I talked to a guy. I talked to a guy who'd been doing radio for a long time. He uh, told me how to get set up set up for pretty cheap, and uh, found a radio network that's uh, now defunct, the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. And uh, Ryan over there was uh, very hospitable. He kind of uh, taught me how to do all this stuff, and uh, gave me a lot of uh, a lot of great tips. And uh, LUA Radio was born yeah, in February of 2015. And uh, basically. I don't know why I, I was uh, I was really really passionate then and uh, obviously still passionate today uh, I've, yeah been going for for four years now I just uh, we just hit the uh, four year anniversary of uh, Liberty Attack radio but I had to kill it had to kill it I've got too much going on and I, I do another podcast too uh, and I've got two other projects I'm working on so um, it wasn't getting the attention that it uh, that it deserved at the same time a lot of the stuff on LUA uh, was it was all basically direct action anyway so it can it can just fall under the uh, the Vani podcast uh, so basically just a, a passion for freedom even even when I didn't know uh, what that word really meant uh, even before I had uh, any coherent philosophy behind it and when I was kind of just jumping from ideology to ideology um, until until I found anarchism uh, I guess mid uh, 2015. So you went through the, did you go through the kind of the steps that a lot of people went through with, um, um, let's see, you've got your uh, Molyneux, um, you've got your Tom Woods, you've got um, everything from Rothbard and to Mises. Did you go through those, um, those stages as well? Uh, yeah, so I started, uh, basically, uh, it was three months after I started Liberty Attack Radio, and it was going to be a conspiracy-based radio show. Like, the first m couple months of episodes were on secret societies and things, uh, and Freemasonry, and 9-11, uh, and, you know, conspiracy theories and such. And I still kind of hold some of those things dear to my heart, because I wouldn't be here without, without uh, investigating those subjects. Um, but yeah, a few months after I started LBA Radio, I... Uh, you know, started talking to some anarchists, and uh, didn't didn't take didn't take very long. Uh, worked through some of my uh, oh, I don't know, I'd, I'd call it controlled schizophrenia now. Uh, trying to to I guess uh, put together a coherent philosophy and, and ideology to adhere to, and uh, basically once I had that, I, I went straight into Austrian economics uh, and philosophy. Read uh, obviously your, your Rothbard, Mises, um, Etienne de la Boetti. Uh, I guess the old French philosopher, one of uh, one of the original uh, um, the original anarchists from I think the 16th century, um, Gustave de Molinari. Um, oh, who else? Um, obviously, you know a lot of Austrian uh, Austrian economists, um, and then yeah, basically um, Rothbard, Konkin. Um, yeah, basically the path kind of kind of kind of typical there. I, I think I found Molyneux towards the end of 2015. 
uh, and you know he had some he had a couple really good videos. I'm sad to see where he is now, but um, anyway, the the videos he had up are, are still there, and I think they're they're valuable. It's just kind of it's just kind of like it's two different people, but uh, um, but yeah, I I I went down kind of the, the typical path, and um, then I guess the path got pretty atypical uh, <laughs> rather quickly after that point. So that led you to uh, to Vanu eventually. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, and, mm -hmm. and how did that? How did that? Where did you first hear about this? Yeah. So uh, in twenty at the beginning of twenty sixteen, I started uh, something called the Direct Action Series on LUA Radio, and uh, it was probably about three months into the Direct Action Series. Uh, my co-host of the Vanu podcast, who unfortunately he's been a lot, he's been really busy, uh, hasn't been able to record for probably well, coming up on four or five months now. But uh, he shot me a link to this book and a book review, and he said, I don't know, it was, it was Ray, it was Vaughn who searched personal freedom, and he said, I don't know anything about this, I've read a couple book reviews, might be interesting if you want to shell out the $30 for it. And uh, I read the book review, and I said, I guess I'm just going to take a shot in the dark, not, not really sure what I'm going to get. Uh, so I ordered uh, one of, I guess, the five copies left on Amazon, and... Uh, I got it and I read it and I was kind of fascinated that this was a guy from uh, the 1960s and 70s that was uh, he had some critiques of anarcho capitalism back then. It, uh, I think I think some of them are, are very fair critiques. He wasn't come at it from a I mean he was a free market guy. He was just uh, very much into uh, into strategy. Um, he had some some very inter interesting critiques of uh, kind of uh, the philosophy I'd been looking into back yeah, back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, he was a very, very radical guy. He uh, was a van nomad for uh, for some time, and uh, then he pursued wilderness fauna, which was basically living in a tent in northern Oregon, uh, or I guess northern California, southern Oregon, in the Siskiyou region. And uh, you know, I was kind of enthralled with it. I mean, it was just, uh, I mean, obviously there were a lot of other strategies he talked about, but uh, it was unlike anything I'd found within the libertarian circles <laughs> up until that point. Like, there might have been a mention or two of seasteading, but uh, that was, and, and obviously agorism, but I hadn't heard about these alternative lifestyles uh, and the pursuance of freedom. So um, I found out about that uh, in March of 2016. And uh, Kyle and I recorded an audiobook for it. I digitized it, which the process was grueling, uh, to say the least. I had to uh, type the entire book into Word. Uh, proofread it four or five times, record the audiobook for it, and then uh, put it out for free. Um, but I didn't want that book to get lost. I knew it was important, uh, and I didn't want it to get lost. So um, the last two episodes we did on the Direct Action series were on Vanu, and both of the episodes are like three hours long. Uh, two longest <laughs> two longest uh, podcasts, in my, or I guess two longest radio episodes in my life. Um, totaling about six hours on Vanu, because we didn't know we were going to start the podcast. It wasn't until... I, I eventually came across some other Vani publications, and I told Kyle, "Man, we need to start the Vani podcast. Like this, that we need people need to know about this." So, uh, yeah, in January of uh, 2017, I guess, yeah, January of 2017, we started the Vani podcast, and the response was incredible from the start because it was completely original. Uh, you really didn't hear anyone else in uh, you know libertarian and anarchist circles talking about uh, about these things. So we kind of had a natural monopoly, and we still kind of do, um, but. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the uh, the, the story of Vanu, and I guess um, for for those who may be new to it, I should probably define that. Uh, so Vanu is basically, um, I guess, lifestyle changes in pursuance of an invulnerability to coercion um, uh, from both public coercers, governments, and private coercers, uh, just per, uh, uh, violators of person and property. So um, I mentioned some of the lifestyles: uh, uh, van nomadism, wilderness Vanu, intentional communities. Um, ethical enclave trading, which is actually a precursor to agorism. Um, it is agorism, but it, but uh, Ray wrote an article on it when Konkin would have been like 17 or 18 years old. And uh, Konkin went, did mention uh, Rayo um, and a handful of publications uh, crediting him for, uh, for his efforts. So uh, it's a little piece of uh, interesting libertarian history that I didn't know I'd come across. Um, I guess other strategies, uh, living on sailboats. Um, strategic relocation, um, like the Free State Project, would be an example of that. Um, you know, the uh, the anarchist comedian Acapulco um, would be another. And uh, what other strategies are there? Um, Vonoming in cities, which is basically trying to be be as invulnerable to coercion as possible in the cities, which uh, we still haven't done a lot of a lot of exploration on that. Uh, but anyway, I guess that'd be uh, kind of how Vonu started, and uh, also um, defining the terms for. Because I know a lot of people haven't heard of Vani, so <laughs> I figured that was important. Yeah, it's uh, very important stuff. So, would you say that Vani was kind of the the answer to 
Um, it's a pragmatic answer to the problems everyone complains about in the anarchist community. You know, we all we all talk about the issues and problems with the state. And what you're saying is that this is potentially a an answer to that question. Um, I would say uh, uh, I'll start by saying yes. It's a very individualizable answer. Um, Vanu is, uh, you know, Ray said this often. Vanu is yours for the making. This isn't uh, this isn't a strategy coming down from you know uh, from a great man or something telling you how to do it. Um, this is uh, Vanu is something that you have to develop for yourself because we all come from different financial situations, uh, family situations. Um, all of those things. So my pursuit of honor is going to be different than yours. I, I yeah, uh, different than yours. Um, my pursuit of honor is going to be different than Kyle's down there in Austin, Texas. Um, so Vonu is very much a, a very much an individual thing. Um, so I think uh, for people who are really passionate about freedom, uh, who are willing to make radical lifestyle changes in pursuance of it, um, I think it's a very practical way um, to go up go about doing it. Um, I definitely do. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, for, for, for some folks, I mean, there are a lot of uh, political crusaders out there who, um, you know, they, they just kind of want to do the politics thing. And, uh, you know, I used to be kind of harsh on them. Um, but now, you know, I mean, they, they can do what they're going to do. I'm going to do, do what I'm going to do. Uh, my pursuit of freedom isn't affected by, um, you know, their, um, their politics. Um, so a lot of folks aren't going to, um, you know, it's a very niche thing. Um, like I said, it's for people who have a radical desire for freedom. Um, and... Um, but yeah, I do think it's practical um, for those who for those who, are, who who really who really desire freedom. I heard a podcast a while ago where you were either a guest or you were part of the uh, uh, kind of part of the I guess hosts. And I think I recall you talking about getting a van and kind of making a you had a plan to kind of I forget where you started and where you ended up, but can you kind of tell that story? Yeah, so that was the that was the plan. Uh, I guess starting about a year ago, actually, just came up on my Facebook memories. I put up a, a post on the Vani Podcast website, a Van Nomad in the making. But uh, you know, things things changed really really quickly. Uh, it changed really drastically. Um, I I'm still interested in the lifestyle, obviously. Um, I think it'd be a lot of fun traveling around. Um, I yeah, still um, when I first uh, heard about Vani, my my dream, and it still is my dream down the road to live on a sailboat or at least uh, you know travel on a sailboat for uh, you know a couple months or something. Um, but yeah, the Van Amazon thing didn't uh, didn't really pan out um, just because I, I guess I guess I got anxious and wanted to just wanted to you know live Vani now um, <laughs> instead of having to buy the van, convert it, and. Uh, um, and, and also, too, um, one of the reasons that Rayo moved on from Van Nomadism to Wilderness Vanu was um, he didn't like the adherence to, to slave tax, the uh, driver's licensure, the registration, um, those sort of, and, also, and, ob and uh, obviously, since you're on public, uh, so-called public roads all the time, um, you can uh, fall under the, uh, under, under the uh, purview of, uh, of the cops very easily. So um, in some ways, it does make you more invulnerable to coercion, but in others, it's... Uh, it's uh, in others it doesn't, but there's there are Venuans out there doing it now, and they they seriously enjoy it, and they have they've had little issues whatsoever. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that didn't pan out. That was that was the that was the goal for that was the goal and kind of the plan for for a few months, um, and then I randomly decided to move to Austin, Texas, um, to live with uh, my co-host of the Bonnie Podcast, uh, Kyle Reardon. Um, so yeah, I lived there for a few months, and then I uh, went to Acapulco for a month and a half, um, with uh, with my buddy Jason Henza and. Uh, then now I'm I'm in Southern Illinois um, on uh, on the homestead. So there really hasn't been a plan to any of this, man. You know, I, I put out a plan, but nothing's gone according to it. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's it's been it's been a tumultuous last like, last six months, I guess. But um, it's been um, extremely freeing, and I mean, it's been a very frugal lifestyle to say the least. But um, I mean, it's 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 been a lot of fun. Um, it really has. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, I you know. I'm not sure how old you are, but I think you're doing exactly what you should do. Not that it really matters, in my opinion, but um, a lot of us get in that trap where, at least, uh, I'm, I won't say my generation, but um, you know, you grew up. Uh, you're, you said, go to go to school, um, go to college, get married, buy a house, have kids, and then just work your life away, and, and wish you had the time to do the things you're doing now. So. Uh, I applaud your your uh, willingness and ability ability to do so. 
Right, right. And, and you know, I, I, I do wish, um, obviously, I was, you know, maybe in a better financial situation, but at the same time, I'm only 26. So, um, mm. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I know some 26 year olds that are in a good financial position at this age, but um, but uh, but not a lot of them. So, um, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I really didn't have anything tying me down and these opportunities arose. And, uh, you know, for, for since I found Vanu, I'd been making excuses the entire time. Like, well, you know, I'll put together a plan and, you know, do this the right way as if there's, you know, a right and a wrong way to, to do it. Um, but, yeah, these opportunities arose and I just took them kind of because I could. Um, and, I mean, it was you know, some of it was uh, was a little a little uh, a little scary, but, uh, you know, kind of the fear of the unknown, not really knowing how, how this was all going to turn out. But. Um, I mean, yeah, it was, uh, it was awesome. Uh, as far as Vano, I did, I did, uh, some country shopping, some uh, strategic relocation, uh, did wilderness Vano in Texas for, in total for about a month. Um, I mean, it was, yeah, it was a, a really, really great experience. And I, I would highly recommend, um, like, uh, also another example, uh, one of my buddies, Jeremy Hangeller, um, I guess starting in June of last year, I think his kind of set me off kind of, uh, um, I've been talking about Vanu for a while and making plans, and uh, Jeremy just decided to move into it, move into his, uh, I don't remember what vehicle he has, like a Honda, uh, I guess a Honda Element, I think it is. He just decided to sell his house and move into his Element, and I was like, damn it. <laughs> like, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and he, he, he made that comment to me first, and I was like, you know, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, but, uh, but he's got, he's got a, uh, uh, he's got a family with two kids, and um, he's, he's made it work, and he's, he's, he's enjoyed the hell out of it. Um, so, I mean, people from all varying walks of life and all varying situations uh, pursue Vanu. Um, so uh, not just it's not just for 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 uh, you know twenty six year olds. Uh, so I figured that that was worth pointing out. Yeah. So did Jeremy ever make the his escape from New York? Um, I guess. Uh, not, do you not, know? Not permanently. No. Um, not permanently. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, I need to actually reach out to him. It's been a, it's been a, probably a few weeks or a month before, since I've talked to him. But uh, no, he's he's still in New York, um, but uh, he's in he's in a better better situation than he was. Um, That's so, good. Um, yeah, he's got he's got an interesting situation worked out. Um, released it did a month ago. I I need to reach out and see how it's going. So yeah, uh, very very conducive for a fan nomad. Yeah, that was that's a sad story that man felt. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you. We, you know, we talked earlier off well online but off the air about uh your project uh your dark lance and dark book project mm -hmm. could you kind of go into that a little bit sure sure so um dark lance i guess the 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 summary before i before i kind of break down some uh, break down a few parts of it but uh, basically dark lance is a privacy focused freelancing marketplace uh utilizing bitcoin for payments um so in essence, I mean, this started out as uh, as a cryptocurrency project called Vonucoin, and uh, it was going to be a one stop shop for self liberation. So we we're going to it was going to do everything like twenty five different things. Uh, but for anyone who's ever been in a development project with uh, without venture capitalist funding and without uh, and kind of as a part time you know hobby sort of thing, um, you can't you can't uh, you know build something secure and, and functional. Uh, you can't uh, of that scale. So we had to we had to hone in our focus a little bit, and uh, the the idea behind it was one of the major hurdles uh, that I've I've heard uh, and that I've kind of experienced um, to finding lifestyles is is work and money. So we figured, well, one thing we can build is a freelancing marketplace, uh, you know, focused on privacy and utilizing Bitcoin, um, and give digital nomads a way to to make money. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the the overview of it. Um, so yeah, I mentioned privacy. Everything's going to be encrypted. Um, there's instant messaging, file transfers. Um, if we can get audio and video chat through Jitsi implemented, uh, then that will all be end to end encrypted as well. Um, we're going to heavily promote security culture. I guess heavily, um, yeah, heavily promote security culture. And in some cases, we're going to make it mandatory um, because if you make if you make privacy a choice, most people won't use it, and it will lessen the privacy and security of everyone else. Um, so privacy will be mandatory in many uh, in many respects. Um, also, we aren't going to ask you. Well, we, I mean, it's we. I mean, it's it's a peer to peer um, decentralized project. So the Dark Lance isn't going to ask you for government documents to prove your identity. We're not going to ask you for a W nine. So if you make more than five hundred dollars, we're going to send that friendly form off to the IRS. Um, nothing like that. Um, I guess uh, um, additionally, there's a, a really cool uh, network out there called Scuttlebutt, and I'm not sure how technically you want me to get, but. 
um, this is this is very good for development. We haven't we haven't gotten into development yet. Um, we've done some testing, but uh, Scuttlebutt will actually be the um, the network protocol that we use, um, the decentralized network protocol, and it's already working now. Um, there's something called um, a Patchwork, which is a decentralized social media platform that you can download and use today. Um, it's a really slick. It's a it's a pretty nice platform. Um, it's not perfect. We uh, we definitely uh, redesign it and such, but. <clears throat> But yeah, I mean, it's uh, that's that's already there. I know our protocol is already there, and uh, that's uh, that puts us uh, a huge huge step ahead. So, um, I guess let me see if there's anything. Uh, and again, I mean, I can go as technical as you want me to. Um, but but yeah, Bitcoin is going to be a core. Uh, it's going to be you know a, a core. It's going to be a core feature of Darklands. Um, not only will it be the method of payments, um, but it will also be um, it also be the foundation for for a part of the reputation system. So. Um, each identity, so consider this like a Facebook profile, um, just to, to make it easier. Um, so a Scuttlebutt identity or a Facebook profile, Scuttlebutt profile, um, would be a Scuttlebutt key and a Bitcoin public key. So um, so all of your jobs and such would be would be, would be um, verifiable on the blockchain to prevent spam and um, to uh, strengthen the reputation system. Um, so Bitcoin is a huge part of this. We couldn't, we, I mean, yeah, we really couldn't do it without Bitcoin. Um, really couldn't so um that's kind of the i guess the the brief overview and some of the some of the key points um but i mean we uh i just released the white paper a month ago uh so if you're uh, if your listeners want to go uh and read uh, through all the grueling details um <laughs> if they're up into technical white papers uh they can go to tinyurl.com forward slash darklands white paper uh, but it's it's just a it's a project I'm, I'm really passionate about and um my focus really for the last year has been trying to build tools um, so that people can live on it. Um, and that's, uh, and Dark Lance is just, um, I guess, uh, the, op another, another offspring of that. Okay. So, so you said earlier, Scuttlebutt is kind of like, uh, like Facebook then? Um, so, so Patchwork, I mean, yeah, so, so Patchwork is like, uh, it's, it's like a social media platform, but all Scuttlebutt is, 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 is a network protocol. So it's just how, um, each, it's how users connect to each other, um, is all Scuttlebutt is. Um, but it's it's very it's a very very secure and um, it's a very secure and functional um, network right now. Um, so I guess um, to think of it this way, and this may not be the the perfect the perfect analogy, but so Facebook would be the social media platform, and say like the internet would be um, the net the way people connect um, on Facebook. So it'd be the network protocol. Okay, and I like the fact that you have that kind of a. Uh almost like a meritocracy as far as um, people's rating. I mean, what, what kind of what kind of things do you think will go into that, uh, you know, being uh, just their work itself or um, how quick they are or all kinds of different uh, um, factors will go into that rating? Um, so, so for, uh, I think you're referring to the reputation system. Yes. And, um, yeah, so, so ratings and reviews, I mean, that's a, that's a tried and true uh, thing you know, Etsy, eBay, Amazon, all of these places use it, and it's it's very very reliable. Um, if uh, someone has five hundred five star reviews on eBay, you can be pretty sure that you're not going to get ripped off. Um, they really want their five star their their, their five star reviews. Um, so that will obviously be um, that will obviously be uh, that'll obviously be a way for reputation in Darklands. But we're going a couple a couple steps further. I mentioned uh, Bitcoin will also be uh, I guess the Bitcoin blockchain will be used for reputation. And uh, we're going a, a, yeah, a step further um, than that with something called the cir uh, circle of trust. And uh, the idea here is that, well, actually, define circle of trust. The idea is that you have like a first and a second layer. Um, the first being the closest. So your first layer, uh, your first uh, layer, your inner, inner layer of trust would be um, your closest friends and your closest family, uh, family members, people you can trust 100% and uh, not have any worry about uh, the risk of uh, coercion or fraud or anything of that nature. Now, obviously, since this is a uh, an open source project, you know, on the internet, then um, that's not always going to be possible. So um, the second layer, of, uh, second layer of trust, would be like friends of friends. So the the, the and I guess the example I used uh, that I use now, I wouldn't recommend anyone do this because people have gotten locked up for money transmitter violations. But um, I uh, so <clears throat> say John goes on Facebook and uh, he's trying to buy Bitcoin and. Uh, uh, Jane is uh, his. Jane is his best friend. You know they've known each other for 20 years. Um, they trust each other pretty well. Well, let's say Jane's friend. Um, 
Steve comes on there and he says, well, I've got some Bitcoin. I'm more than happy to sell it to you. Well, John doesn't know Steve, but, um, but Jane knows Steve very, very well. Um, so John doesn't necessarily have to know um, that person directly um, in order to, you know, have trust that that transaction is going to be uh, successful and that uh, there's not going to be any, any fraud. Um, so the idea is, you know, utilizing friends of friends, um, utilizing uh, reputation, I guess, uh, utilizing secondary reputation, um, at least in some sense. So, um, I mean, the anarchist community is great for this, right? Um, in many, many regards. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, the, the, cir the circle of trust thing um, is, is very, very, I, I think, um, very underutilized. Um, so we're, we're, that's, uh, that's something we're going to use in, uh, in Darklands. And beyond that, um, the Scuttlebutt Network Protocol is by default set up for two hops. Um, so peers can only connect if they're within two hops of each other. And that would be the second layer of trust. And once you get outside of those second layers, you're out into kind of the unknown and the risk of fraud and coercion increases drastically. Um, or it may increase drastically, but there's just a higher risk of it. So, um, yeah, we, we want to we try to limit. I mean, Vani was all about becoming as influential with coercion as humanly possible. So, obviously, we want to make sure that uh, the people who use Darklands uh, can um, evade that as much as, as much as they can. Yeah, that is that's interesting stuff right there. It sounds like, I mean, obviously you put a ton of work into this. Um, I looked over your white paper and, you know, I read the words, but it kind of just, you know, my jaw kind of went slack and drool came out of the corner of my mouth looking at it, trying to, you know, really make sense of it. it it's quite impressive, that's for sure. Thank um, you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. So you have a couple books now or you got, how many books are you up to now? Uh, just the one, <laughs> just the just one. The I'm working. One. I'm working on the second one now. Um, but that first one took in total like a year and a half to do. And I just, I guess, I guess I just released that, um, maybe uh, towards the end of last year. So, um, yeah, I'm working on the second one now. But uh, the the one that's out now is called Vanuay's Strategy for Self Liberation, and um, it's basically uh, I mentioned uh, Rayo's book that I found that kind of started this entire journey. It was called Va uh, Vanuay's Search for Personal Freedom. And uh, the idea with this book was basically to cover the philosophy briefly and uh, cover the Konkin and uh, Rayo connection, because I thought that was particularly interesting, because Konkin's pretty popular in our circles. Um, and then I just kind of walked through uh, all uh, as many lifestyle changes as I could uh, and uh, told people kind of how to, how to, how to go about, uh, how they could go about doing it. So, um, yeah, that's available on Amazon and also at uh, libertyunderattack.com. But, uh, and this will be, uh, I guess, a, a scoop for, for your audience. I haven't actually talked about it yet. Um, but the second book I'm working on is obviously, um, we just talked about Darklands. Crypto anarchism is, I guess, I guess crypto anarchist is kind of like the primary label I go by now. So my next book is going to be, uh, I guess, maybe tentatively titled, uh, uh, titled Crypto Anar uh, Venuan's Guide to Crypto Anarchism or something like that. So basically talking about how um, these various open source uh, technologies and Bitcoin uh, can help to make individuals more invulnerable to coercion. So um, that's uh, in the process, but I don't know how quick that'll how quick that'll come out. <laughs> we'll see. Right. Uh, you're yeah. That's, you're doing a lot of work, man. Um, talk about going mobile. Sure. So uh, going mobile is uh, an audiobook available. Uh, under Libertarian Attack Publications, I think the only one right now. Yeah, the only one right now. And uh, Going Mobile is basically, uh, it's a, a Venu and Van Life publication from like the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so Rayo has a couple a couple few articles in there uh, kind of talking about uh, 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 the Van Nomadism lifestyle. Um, there were some other articles and uh, other articles and experiences from other Van Nomads back in that time. Uh, there were some very retro uh, <laughs> van conversion uh, diagrams and things. Uh, they didn't have YouTube like we do today, so it was it was funny to to, to look back uh, at to compare like the YouTube video, like the YouTube van builds, which there there's so many of them. You could you could watch for months. Of, you could watch van conversion videos for months months in a row and not run out of them. Um, but it was just it was, it was it was very cool to look back at like in the 1970s and watch how these pe how how these Venuans were. I guess trying to to design their vans for for living aboard, um, so yeah, that's that's going mobile. It was just uh, I guess a van life uh, magazine from uh, the sixties and seventies. Okay, so besides you know, if we consider Vanu your your major, do you have a, a minor? I mean, do you have a 
I mean, what's your what's your secondary thing that kind of uh, you're, you're interested in 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 the in the realm, or do you have one? Sure. Um, so yeah, Vaughn, Vaughn is definitely first, and uh, I, I guess uh, I, I guess uh, you asked a, a question in pre-show, like is, uh, is is which one's kind of the parent and which one's kind of the offspring, or a question a question like that. Well, Vaughn is kind of the parent of everything that I do, and then everything else kind of uh, stems stems from that. So, um, like I said, a cri crypto anarchism is uh, truly, uh, I guess, my secondary passion, and it, it's a primary passion too because um, I think crypto anarchism is one of the most practical tools that we have to make ourselves invulnerable to, to the coercion of the state, um, to increase our privacy, and to um, build pockets of freedom in the here and now. So um, I guess one of the main, main differences between me and, and quite a few other crypto anarchists is when I bring up Vanu to, to some of them, like they're still thinking purely digital. That, uh, you know, well, we can't be free until Bitcoin is, you know, the standard current, the, you know, the, I guess the, uh, the, the standard medium of exchange. Or that, um, yeah, but basically that, that, you know, we can't be free until, you know, big, in, until like something like that happens. And um, there's a book that we have uh, under Liberty Attack Publications called Second Round Book on Strategy. And it was the first attempt I saw um, by Smuggler and XYZ to, obviously pseudonyms, to combine the crypto anarchist realm, not only in the purely digital sense, but also in the physical sense. So us utilizing these technologies to actually... Um, be able to build pockets of freedom in physical space and time. Um, so that's kind of, that's, I mean, that's everything I do. I love the digital realm. I love encryption. I love um, these uh, decentralized marketplaces. I love all of these things. But human beings are social creatures. I mean, I think that's why Freedom Festivals like the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest um, and Jackalope and Anarchapulka when all these, all these events are getting so popular is because we kind of get sick of the all internet thing, right? I um, mean, you know, we want we want to go meet meet uh, you know, meet like minded people. So there's already this this natural passion and drive to um, be around each other, uh, be around like minded people, and um, that's I think crypto anarchism is a great way um, to do that for privacy and security and um, and you know for for the for economies like Bitcoin. Um, I think it's um, it's really one of the most self liberatory technologies or self liberatory. Uh, strategies that we have uh, available to us today and previous Venuans did not have it so we better to him utilize it <laughs> yeah that's for sure so you know the i was aware of the when bitcoin kind of came into um it was actually toward the beginning i don't know how i heard about it but it really intrigued me it must have been through um you know, I'm sure some kind of anarchist uh, style uh, website or something. And it, of course it started off real slow. It's uh, kind of made its, uh, its, its gains and losses. And then it kind of skyrocketed for a while there as, as we all mm -hmm. saw, and then started to drop and drop and drop. Do you think that at least my speculation is it seems like it's actually returning to its real, um, for lack of a better term, value now that all the the people who kind of, you know, pumped and dumped got out mm -hmm. and we're starting to see more of a plateau and it's actually the, the true plateau. Sure, uh, and, and I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's an unfair or necessarily uh, inaccurate um an accurate outlook on it. Um, I guess I guess the way that uh, the way that I look at it is, if you look back at the history of the price of Bitcoin, I mean these uh, these drops aren't um, they aren't abnormal, and you know year to uh, bear markets aren't uh, abnormal either. Um, but I, I guess I guess what I what I'd really um, and obviously I care about I care about price. Um, I, I obviously care about price. Um, but you also have to consider too that um, really the the only People that have, uh, I guess, the only we're speaking in terms of like uh, nations or I guess uh, geographies, um, really like uh, places like Venezuela and Greece who have like they who have like true true economic crashes. Um, they realize that you know they realize firsthand the utility of Bitcoin. Um, but in a lot of Western, I guess, a lot of Western nations, a lot of Western countries, that ne that need really isn't uh, visible yet. Um, it will be sometime, um, but I don't know when that's going to be. I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to predict uh, when the when the crash is going to be. Plenty of other people have done that before me and been wrong. So, and they're a lot smarter than I am. 
Um, but I think I think what I'd what I'd really focus on when it comes to Bitcoin is um, bear markets are for building. So um, like there's uh, like for example Lightning Labs, um, the people that are building the Lightning Network, uh, the off-chain scaling solution. Um, there's been a ton of progress in that realm, um, despite the price being what it is. Um, there's been a ton of work. Um, there's uh, you can go buy you can buy a, a Lightning node today and start accepting Lightning payments. Um, or I guess you can open up a Lightning channel. So um sure like uh obviously you know bitcoin's still an experimental bitcoin's still experimental i mean don't put in don't, don't put in any more money than uh you can you know afford to lose um but lightning's definitely that way now too um but uh, uh the off scale or i guess the um the off chain scaling also provides uh huge increases in privacy as well so um well i don't think like i said i don't think your your outlook is inaccurate and no one can really foresee the future but regardless of uh, regardless of price, the technology will still work. Um, it will still work. Um, now, obviously, there's economic incentives like uh, for miners. If it's if it drops down to ten dollars, they, they um, there may not be as many miners. Um, if it drops down to ten dollars, then um, you know so there, there's there's some certain some economic ramifications. But the important thing is that regardless of price, the technology still works. Um, so that's kind of the the. I guess the, the view that I have on it, but I'm not going to be like some of those folks who say, I don't look at price. I do look at price, but I'm more concerned about the technology um, at this point because we're still only 10 years into Bitcoin. Uh, so we, we can't, we can't see, I mean, we, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, we really don't. Like I said, tech, the technology behind it is what's important. Um, it's uh, what's so freeing and uh, I don't know. That's why I'm exci excited about it. So you you must have already bought your Lam your Lamborghini then. So you're you're done with it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, def definitely not done. No, definitely not done. No. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, uh, I had a I had a, a decent portfolio, but due to some some personal economic downturns, I had to liquidate um, some of my portfolio, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, if I if I, I and see a lot of people who had big stacks who didn't sell at the high point, um, they're probably not feeling too happy about it. So. Um, they may have a yeah. different perspective. Right, right. Hey, have you had a chance? Um, have you had any speaking speaking engagements anywhere to uh, kind of share the message, spread the message? Uh, yeah. So every year, um, I speak at the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest, um, and that's uh, I, it's it's June it's uh, June of this year. I don't remember this this specific date, but uh, I'll be giving a talk uh, again. Um, and this year will be uh, another talk on Vanu. Uh, it'll be called Vanu, the Strategy for Self-Liberation, same title as my book. Um, last year, I did, the, I did a talk on Second Realm Book on Strategy. Um, that was that uh, book by Smuggler and XYZ about merging crypto anarchists in the digital realm with the physical realms. And um, let me see. Yeah, the year before, I did uh, my first talk on Vanu when I, I knew a lot less than I do now. So it's kind of time for a... I guess a Redux version of that speech, and one that's actually uh, on video, um, like last year's was. Um, but outside of that, no, I was going to go to Anarchapulco this year and uh, Anarchaforco um, in Acapulco, um, but some my I guess uh, situation here precluded me from doing so, and I'm, it's uh, it worked out okay. Uh, it worked out okay. Um, but um, yeah, nothing else to really speak of uh, as far as uh, speaking engagements. But uh, I always enjoy going to the MPL Fest. And uh, it's always a great crowd and always very receptive to the uh, strange subjects I bring to the table. <laughs> so ones that yeah. no one else does. Now, where do they, where do they hold the MPL? Um, yeah, so the, uh, the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest is in Delton, Michigan. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of the southwestern part uh, of Michigan. Um, okay. So beautiful, beautiful location. Um, I mean, like, uh, you know, ever, I guess the past couple of years, there's been, like, I guess, two years ago, maybe 100 people last year maybe 150 people i mean it's still at the point now where it's uh there's there's you you won't have time to talk to everybody or meet everybody but um it's still you know very very close-knit so it's still got that sort of atmosphere that i think probably pork fest had well five or seven years ago or however many years ago i don't know i, I never went to pork fest yeah it always seems like those things happen either in the midwest or the east or uh down in mexico so uh I would like to bring something like that up here to the Northwest. It seems like we're kind of lacking in that, uh, the movement up here. Okay. So um, you're, you're in the Northwest then. Okay. Um, let me see. 
yeah, I don't know. I think the closest thing to you would be Jackalope, and that's uh, it's in the southwest. <laughs> so um, that's that'd probably be a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty big trek. Yeah. So yeah, it's un- it's unfortunate. But you, yeah, definitely get out to one when you when you when you get a chance. Um, there's there, you know, life changing experiences. And uh, talked about second realms. Fruit and festivals are second realms. Um, you know, it's it's one of the few times a year uh, a lot of anarchists get to experience uh, you know the cult you know an anarchist culture um so yeah for you and and your listeners if you ever have a chance to get out to a freedom festival i don't really care which one it is um just get out there and uh i mean yeah you'll you'll have you'll undoubtedly have a great time it sounds like i have to start my own then up here in uh up here in washington state it's it's kind of an enclave up here anyway, so I should probably try to bring some more peace-loving people out of the woodwork and, and see see what I get. Um, oh, yeah. So you, you, you've mentioned a few times uh, Second Realm. Can you kind of give a, and you probably already have gone over it, but can you kind of give a brief uh, kind of a summary of that? Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Um, so the First Realm, um, if you're talking about the Second Realm, we've got to talk about the First Realm. So the First Realm is... Um, basically just the, the status, the, the status world that we live in. It's uh, all of the coercion, the violence, the lack of freedom, the lack of privacy, the lack of financial opportunity, um, the lack of financial choices, uh, you know, th- those sorts of things. It's, uh, it's what, it's what anarchists are very familiar, very familiar with. It's what, uh, you know, we, we kind of rant and rave against and try to try to make ourselves free from, free from. Um, so that's the first realm. Um, the second realm is... Basically, uh, um, if your listeners are familiar with uh, Hakeem Bey's notion of temporary autonomous zones, um, it's basically pockets of freedom. Um, it's basically pockets of freedom where we can be free um, and you know do what we, do what we want to. So another way to put it is um, not building the new society within the shell of the old, but building the new society outside of it and despite it, uh, despite its existence. So the ideas and uh, so some examples here that I that I could uh, that I could. Um, put out there uh, for if, if you or any of your listeners have uh, uh, read or watched uh, Janiel Schumann's Alongside Night, um, Aurora um, would be an example of a second realm. Um, there's a book that we have uh, available under Liber- Libertarian Attack Publications called Hashtag Agora. Um, there are second realms uh, all through that book. Um, let me see here. Um, basically, uh, um, a, a, a temporary, uh, I guess, a, a van nomad squat spot would be would be a second realm. Um, it's a place, uh, you know, it's uh, mobile in nature. Um, the, coercers, if you, the coercers can't find you, the coercers can't coerce you. Um, so a van nomad squat spot would be a second realm. Um, freedom festivals would be second realms. Um, I guess uh, in, some, in some sense, like uh, uh, yes, uh, some places throughout the world could be considered second realms, like, uh, like uh, Acapulco for some, um, Puerto Rico for others, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's basically just places where we as individuals can be free and exercise our autonomy without having to worry about the coercive, um, the, the coercive society um, that exists. Um, that's kind of the idea, is uh, just being free in the here and now um, and uh, implementing safeguards and security measures to uh, ensure that we can do so. So... The uh, it got me thinking about something. Um, of course, a lot of us would like to uh, kind of pursue that Vanu lifestyle, mm-hmm. you know, as soon as possible and to the fullest extent as possible as well. Um, but obviously, you know that you know, we're, we're all kind of, well, I can't say all of us, but at least myself kind of trapped, you know, got... Uh, Got bills to pay and and uh, got work to go to. Got to get that health insurance, you know. Oh, yeah. What are, are there any small things that you know an individual or family could do that kind of just just a little bit at a time, kind of have that kind of detract from the state? You know, are there any techniques, um, uh, you know, things we can do, places we can go, people we can talk to to kind of uh, get that more of that feeling. Sure. Yeah. Of, of course. And uh, uh, they're they're definitely uh, definitely small. I mean, small but not insignificant things that you can do. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things I've, I I always recommend because I mean you you can start doing this for for little to no cost. I mean, very. You, I mean, you can spend as much as you want to on anything. People will take your money and, and provide you with something. But um, you can spend as little as you want to on something like food storage. Um, so for the for for the time when. Uh, 
um, you know, for the time when, uh, you know, maybe someone loses their job, uh, maybe someone in your family loses their job and, uh, you know, don't have a whole lot of money for food. Well, if you have a bunch of uh, food storage reserves, then that comes in handy at that point. Um, if there's something like uh, economic collapse or, um, you know, some, you know, something worse than that or something, some other uh, catastrophe, um, well, making yourselves, uh, you know, making, you know, getting as self-sufficient as you possibly can so you aren't reliant upon, um, those institutions of the first realm, like uh, like uh, grocery stores and, uh, um, uh, you know, like uh, the welfare state and things like that. Um, that's a terrific thing. Basically, ensuring that you can survive, um, ensure you can survive if those things cease to exist tomorrow. Um, that's a, a major, major first step. And um, I think it's, uh, for a lot of folks, it's it's the first of many. Um, that would, yeah, that'd be the uh, um, the, the first thing. Um, beyond that, I mean, just, uh, I, I'd say try to, uh, 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 strategically, uh, strategic, uh, I can't ever say this word, strategically withdraw from the state in every way possible that you can. Um, so I've, uh, for years I've recommended people cancel their voter registration. It's a very small thing, but it feels very good to do. Um, and you can go to, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash cancel voter, um, if you want to, uh, find out how to do it in your state. Um, that's a very good, very, you know, very freeing first, very freeing first step. Once you cancel your voter registration, you can't legally vote. Not saying that uh, <laughs> you couldn't find a way to if you wanted to, but, um, uh, but, but still, I think that's, uh, that's another good thing you can do. Um, use uh, Bitcoin and barter um, as, as much as you can, um, not using uh, government fiat. Um, oh, what else? I mean, start your own garden. Um, I mean, you can do this in... Uh, in um, and and uh, up there in the northwest, I'm sure uh, may, maybe you live in a in a rural area. You know, just uh, you know, grow your own food. Um, I lived in a city and had a garden for for a few years. Uh, very, it was a it was a rather small garden, but I had to give food away. Um, it was producing so much. Um, so yeah, produce uh, produce as much as you can yourself, and uh, become as self sufficient as possible. And uh, the the I guess the last piece of advice I'll pause at right now is. And this will, regardless of what you decide to do, even if you can't, um, even if you can't pursue, uh, you know, a Vani lifestyle like van nomadism or p perpetual traveling or um, something like that, um, pursue financial and financial independence. Um, and this is done by way of, um, uh, you know, cutting your expenses and saving as much as you possibly can, so that at some point you can, uh, so you can retire earlier, uh, you know, earlier than the corporate government-approved age of retirement. Um, so, for example, like. Um, uh, there's a guy named Jake DeSillis, and I, I it, well, I'll use him as an example. I'm pretty sure he's he. I'm pretty sure he. Yeah, he is. He wrote books on it. Um, but uh, basically, he um, um, he wrote a, a, a book called Four Ways with the Rat Race, and um, I think he's uh, he's like 40 or he's, he may be like 40, and he's already retired. Um, a job becomes optional for him. Um, so the idea is to cut your expenses, save as much as you can. Um, so that she can retire as early as possible, um, and then uh, also um, along that along that same line of thought, frugality um, that that goes right along with cutting expenses, and um, then also too, um, if there's any possible way, I mean, there's you know on you know the uh, the internet provides a lot of opportunity um, directly in school too, hopefully in the near future, um, but uh, uh, making your making your employment location independent. So if uh, uh, another term for it is digital nomadism, um, where you can work from anywhere, um, even if you don't do it, even if you work from home, um, the amount of freedom, I, I worked from home for a few months in Austin, and I uh, wasn't making a lot of money, but I'll tell you what, being able to wake up 15 minutes before I was supposed to start work, and uh, not having to have like a two hour commute every day, um, and being able to actually have my hour breaks, um, or I guess being able to have like the entirety of my, my full hour breaks and making my lunch and going back and sit, sit down and watching YouTube videos on Van Nomadism. I mean, it's even if you don't do anything beyond that, just the amount of freedom, something uh, like just financial independence or location independent, uh, location independent employment can do for you. Um, it's really, really crazy. So uh, crazy in a good way. So I guess that would be um, a long winded way to, uh, to toss out those, I guess, little nuggets of advice. It sounds a lot like, you know, preparedness and uh, homesteading um, type techniques that you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, and I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's it's hard work and it's it's um, you know, it's it's sometimes it can be hard work and a lot of work. But, yeah, um, it's basically uh, returning to the land and it's 
going back to, uh, I guess, the early 20th century because that's they didn't have a choice. They had to produce for themselves. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, <laughs> going back in time, at least in the, to a certain extent, or going back to, uh, uh, going back to our, our true roots without, um, I guess, uh, mass urbanization. So, yeah, exactly. Um, exactly right. Yeah, I read a lot of uh, kind of articles on different uh, kind of preparedness websites, and uh, people are always talking about in the U.S., you know, where where is the best place to live, and uh, and as far as uh, whether it's there's an ec economic meltdown or whether there's uh, you know food riots or whatever or mm -hmm. natural disasters. Um, have you, I'm sure you probably have kind of looked around in the U.S. and kind of, you know, is there a top three places or at least areas of the of the, uh, the, the nation that you'd kind of put your, you know, hang your hat? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And the place I ended up is, a, is an interesting one because it's not one that would be, it wasn't, I guess it, it wouldn't be the one at the top of really anybody's list. But um, yeah, I live in, I, I live in Southern Illinois now. And uh, obviously Chicago is terrible. Um, you know, they love passing, uh, you know, very restrictive gun laws and, uh, you know, that's, it's, I think it's, it's number one or two, uh, it's number, number one or two states, uh, state in the U S for people like it. so it's, a mass, it's a mass exodus. So, um, uh, basically I, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way first and then I'll kind of give, uh, give more thought to it. But, uh, uh, for me, I mean, uh, this, my family is my family and, uh, the friends I have are close to here. Um, I've been coming here for 25 years of my life. I'm very comfortable here. It's very peaceful. Um, I haven't seen cops come ever come here in 25 years. Um, never seen a cop. Um, I just I feel very I feel very very safe here, and um, I guess I've got it set up in such a way. Um, I guess uh, in second realm terms, to be called a proxy merchant. Like uh, and Ray Ray also talked about this too. But um, having uh, your name on property can increase your risk of coercion. So I've got uh, an interesting situation set up here, um, obviously uh, with family, um, but um, it, it, it helps. Um, I, I, it helps with, uh, I guess, with with, uh, with Vanu. So um, I think that the, the first answer to that would be um, if there's some place like, uh, like this, some, uh, some place for any of you or your listeners that uh, something like I have, um, it may not be the most ideal place, but it may be... Um, the place where um, you may be most happy and most peaceful and uh, also um, make yourself as vulnerable to coercion as you possibly can. Um, now, to answer your question more specifically, um, I've always been, I've always been uh, interested in the Pacific Northwest, actually, because uh, that's where Ray has spent a large part of his time, a large part of his time. Um, he also spent time in Bella Coola, British Columbia. So, I mean, very wilderness locations. Uh, you're really rough in it. Um, but... Um, and a lot of people don't want don't want to uh, to live such a lifestyle. But um, if uh, you kind of more uh, kind of like uh, your isolation and your kind of uh, you know kind of peacefulness like that, um, those would be options, I suppose. I don't have I don't know anything beyond uh, anything about Bella Coola, British Columbia beyond that it looks beautiful and uh, there's no roads. <laughs> so um, you know, take that take that for what it's worth. Um, I don't know. Like I, I went to Austin, Texas for, for a few years. Maybe Austin is not the best place um, considering it's, 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 it's a conundrum. It really is. It's, it's a very socialist place, but there's lots of guns. They don't try to take them. So it's very strange. Uh, it's very strange and anomaly. Uh, it's not like that in most places, but um, I, I don't know, like somewhere in Texas. I, I mean, I, I don't really like just uh, make sure it's an unincorporated area so that you can actually do the off-grid homesteading thing. They don't try to, uh, um, hammer you with ordinance violations. Um, that would be the most important piece of advice. Make sure it's unincorporated because if you try to do off-grid stuff like collect rainwater or uh, not have uh, you know a proper septic tank or um, you know um, try to get off city water or something like that, uh, you know you could you could run into some problems. So I like Texas because it's a very open gun culture. I mean, open carry is legal there without a permit, and you don't have to have a permit to buy any firearms. So um, as far as self-defense. Um, there's really uh, no better, no better place. Um, so, I mean, those would be. I I haven't done a whole lot of a lot of investigation into uh, into other locations because I, I really hadn't off grid. You know, the off grid homesteading thing wasn't going to be something I do, I I was going to do immediately. But um, 
here I am again. My my planning goes. My planning is uh, not very good, but worked out for the best, I think. So I know you gotta get. I know you gotta go pretty soon. But um, I was just uh, when you were talking about the um, different areas to live. I, I can't recall if it was your podcast I heard this on or not, but it was about a like a proxy um, uh, mail service where. You can mm -hmm. set it up, and I forget where it was uh, where it was located. Somewhere I think in Colorado. Right, um, right, right. Um, so they were, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I can definitely speak to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I could go for for, for another 15, 20 minutes if you have if you have more questions. I'm uh, yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, trying to rush out of here. Um, but yeah, so that's called uh, your best address, and um, it's it's kind of a fascist setup, but it's a very uh, very handy. Uh, you know, a very handy thing for people who don't, uh, who are, who are uh, nomads. Um, so one of the, the major problems is, uh, like, if you have to get mail or get things delivered to you and you don't have a home address, um, it can be difficult. And if you're, if it's things like credit cards or, uh, you know, God forbid, government documents, um, you can't get those sent a lot of times to P.O. boxes. So what your best address provides is a physical address. It's a, it's a P.O. box, basically, but it's a physical address. Um, there's actually a physical location, and um, you can use that for um, for residents in South Dakota, vehicle registration in South Dakota, and um, and getting your driver's license in South Dakota. Um, now, if you're if you're a resident of uh, technically say like somewhere like Texas, um, emission inspection would be a pain, and if you haven't registered your vehicle in Texas, um, they will uh, they'll, they'll uh, get you pretty hard for that. Um, it's very very expensive. So someplace like your best address could save you a lot of money. And um, if you're living a nomadic lifestyle, um, you know, it's, you got to have somewhere for, for your mail to be sent. And uh, it's basically a remailer service. So, like, they'll, they'll take pictures of the outside of your mail, and they'll say, uh, you know, if you want us to throw this away, we'll, we'll dispose of it safely for you. Um, you want us to take it out and send you a picture of it, um, we can do that. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the best services out there um, that I've been able to find. Um, and, uh, actually I mentioned Jeremy Hangeller. He's, he's been using your best address for, um, I guess probably six or seven months now. They even set up his vehicle registration in South Dakota. He's, he's a resident of South Dakota now. And he said, uh, compared to New York where he's from, um, he, he was in and out of the DMV there in 10 minutes. <laughs> so like the South Dakota, South Dakota is hurting for revenue. It is super cheap to do it. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a legal interstice, you know, some, it's, uh, uh, way to utilize, uh, you know, various legal jurisdictions uh, to your benefit. So if uh, you're living a nomadic lifestyle, maybe you don't want to spend that much on a PO box. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's available, yourbestaddress.com. And I'm, I'm not sponsored by them in any way whatsoever, but I really should try to get an affiliate, affiliate program set up with them because I've sent so many people their way. Right. Now, do you have to be there in person to get the uh, your license there? Uh, or so do you know? You, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. Um, you have to stay, um, stay there for one night every five years. Um, so Jeremy went up to South Dakota, stayed at an RV park, got a receipt, went to the DMV, and he's a resident of South Dakota now. Just you have to stay there. You have to stay one night there at some place where you can get a receipt, a hotel, RV park, um, some place like that. So you never have to go back there. <laughs> you never have to go back there except like every five years or so. Okay, and so it also changes your uh, your your taxes and and things from wherever you're living to uh, whatever the uh, tax burdens are in South Dakota. Sure, sure, yeah. So, uh, like uh, uh, the county state of Illinois here, um, the excise—I don't remember the the specific figures, but the excise tax for buying a vehicle is uh, is quite a bit cheaper in South Dakota. Um, there's no state income tax in South Dakota. Um, it's it's cheap. It's just cheaper to do everything there. So, uh, yeah, there's there's financial benefits to it, uh, depending upon where you live. Obviously. Yeah. Do you have to actually slap on some South Dakota license plates on your car? Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They they send you license plates. Yep. So. That would be nice. Uh, yeah, I have to look into that. Um, here in Washington, the uh, vehicle tabs. Are creeping back up there. There was a few years ago where I forgot the guy's name, but he actually managed to get oh, it was Tim Iman? That's right, a ballot um, or initiative on the ballot about dropping the license or the uh, 
car tab fees at a flat rate of 30 bucks and it actually passed and uh washington residents you know a lot of well it, it was really mixed i was surprised by how many people were um actually just they were just being huge statists and all they wanted to do was pay more for some reason and they hated the guy <laughs> uh, but i never figured out why they would hate a guy that saved them money you know uh, it was it was crazy but the rest of us um uh, logical rational people were you know were lauding him as a you know a saint or something but i'm not sure why it's kind of uh, crept up over the last um must have been 20 years ago or or around there um but right. yeah it's been very nice to at that point to have those 30 dollar tabs and I got to look up and see what South South Dakota's up to these days, and I might just have to go ahead and make that change myself. Yeah, I, I, so, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't, rec- I don't recall off the top of my head. But um, for those folks, I, I would just emphasize to them that the government does accept voluntary. You know, they do accept donations. Um, for those folks, it, believe it or not, um, one one of the it's not one of the main funders of like the police force, but there's a there's a quite substantial portion of police funding that's voluntary donations. So if if they if they want to pay more, they can. Uh, <laughs> the government's not going to stop them. Right. Yeah, that's actually a good uh, public service announcement for any statists out there. If you if you feel bad about um, you know not paying your fair share. There's probably a tip jar available online that you can uh, just kind of look it up and and send your, your hard earned money in there voluntarily. Um, there so go. hey man, um, is there anything you'd like to uh, to go over or uh, talk about since um, kind of let you have the floor for a minute or so? Sure, sure. So um, I, I guess I'd like to talk uh, just for a moment about Libertarian Attack Publications. Now, I mentioned that uh, we've got books for sale, um, and obviously they're, they're all geared towards solutions. Um, so if you're an individual looking to increase your personal freedom in a wide variety of ways, um, there's, uh, there's a book there for you. Um, but also, too, uh, um, one of the uh, – something that I'm really, really excited about is, uh, I guess, some, it's a, a feature on the website called uh, Publish With Us. And uh, so we're seeking out individuals who are looking, uh, looking for publishers. So um, if you want your, if you just want your book published and promoted by us, um, more than more than happy to do it. Um, definitely more than happy to do it. Um, but we can also help new authors navigate uh, uh, the, comp- the the seemingly complicated uh, publishing process. So if you if you uh, finish your first manuscript and you want uh, some people to take a look at it, be more than happy to and help you get it uh, closer to uh, to publishing ready. Uh, so yeah, proofreading and editing. Um, we offer uh, paperback and Kindle formatting, and uh, also uh, yeah, pu- paperback and Kindle formatting, so that whenever you uh, submit it to Amazon uh, and people order copies, it looks great, exactly as you uh, as you wanted it to. And uh, lastly, uh, and this is something I've been slacking on, um, but it's the thing that takes the most time. Um, but if you're if you're going to be publishing a book, you've got to have an audio book. Um, a lot of people nowadays don't actually pick up physical copies of books. They're too busy. They, may, they might listen in their car, um, yeah, on, on their commute. Maybe, maybe when they're maybe some van nomads who are traveling, um, they uh, might want to listen to an audiobook instead of actually read a physical book. Uh, you got to have an audiobook for it. So we do uh, full audiobook uh, production, uh, and uh, I've got uh, a few uh, a few voice actors that can actually do the audiobook for you. Um, actually, one female voice actor too, if uh, that's your that's your preference. So. Um, Basically, what we're trying to do, I mean, the, 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 uh, the slogan, I guess you could say, for Libertarian Tech Publications is uh, share your story and find your freedom. So if you've got, uh, if you've been, uh, you know, I guess uh, people have got some interesting stories, uh, some interesting ways to find freedom. And uh, we, we want to we wanna help you get, uh, get your message out there. And uh, we want to make it as easy as possible. Um, and better yet, we don't believe in intellectual property. So if you, when you sign with another publishing company, they're probably going to want you to sign away like 20% commission or something like that. Um, and, you know, some, maybe sign over the rights to your book or whatever, um, whatever it may be. We don't believe in intellectual property. We just want to help you get your message out there and uh, more than happy to help you in whatever way we can. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, interested in that um, go to libertyandertack.com forward slash publish. Or if, uh, you know, you're just looking for... Um, Looking to support a digital digital agorist or digital ethical enclave trader, um, libertyandertack.com um, is there too with uh, with some very very valuable books. Um, so, with that said, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's uh, that's that's my little spiel. That's your little spiel, okay? Yeah, that's a great resource. I've I've actually been considering trying to, uh, you know, I think like most 
anarchists and voluntarists there we have a lot of uh a lot of ideas and thoughts and rolling around in our minds and uh, some some folks will choose the podcast and some some guys will do video and um then others will you know write for blog sites but uh, i think there's something valuable about actually putting out a book um to kind of kind of just get all those thoughts out and kind of a a stream of consciousness you know and and uh, it's like i I was talking to somebody the other day and uh, it seems like we were talking about earlier with along the way, it's picking up a little bit of information or knowledge from, um, you know, a myriad of different people, whether they're on YouTube or whether they're uh, uh, a book you pick up or, uh, you know, a blog article you read. Each little, each little piece kind of helps build that, uh, as I called it, a mosaic. Right. And um, and I think the more voices and the more perspectives out there, uh, and also not not every speaker or or you know, media type is is apt for everybody, and everybody right. kind of needs their they they'll like you know say some folks will uh, they'll watch Larkin Rose videos and they they get a lot of their influence from him, and and some folks think he's just way too abrasive, so. Um, I think it, take, it takes a village, man. It takes a village. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I'm certainly right there with you um, because uh, this this path to uh, to personal freedom, this path to, um, I guess, just um, this this path towards learning is different for everybody. Um, so I, I, I always encourage, uh, uh, something I encourage for the Vani podcast, there's something called self liberational media. And uh, basically, it's just uh, all of the Van Nomad videos on YouTube to be considered this. The Minimal Sibling videos to be considered this. Uh, the Vani podcast to be considered this. And, uh, I mean, we're doing a, a nice piece of self-liberational media right now. Um, I encourage everyone, um, you know, if, if you're pursuing some lifestyle, even if it turns out to be a drastic failure, document it um, in some way, if, whether it's a blog post. If you write a book about it and you get to the end of the book and you find out, eh, this was a fail. Um, well, you might help uh, save someone from that from that same mistake. Um, if you uh, you know, or or you may you may come out with like the most amazing journey, um, the the most uh, they the most amazing journey, and uh, that's that's certainly worth sharing too. Um, so yeah, I think everyone should, uh, in whatever medium they prefer and whatever medium they're comfortable with, um, and whether uh, pseudonymously, anonymously, or uh, you know, with a you know via a given name. Uh, I think uh, it's it's crucially crucially important because we, we can talk all day and every day about how great anarchism is, how great the philosophy is, um, how great the ethics are, and all of that. But people really, at least this has been my experience, um, it's kind of the lead by example thing, right? Although we don't like the whole leaders thing, um, but it's it's kind of the the, the action over uh, the action over talk. Um, that seems to be more convincing than, than just the talking. So um, that's that's kind of something that I that I that I really push out there and I encourage um, is show people show people what you're doing for to, to find freedom. Uh, I think it's really really crucially important, especially if uh, um, I hope someday to see a free society in my lifetime. I really hope so, um, but it's it's going to take some some hard work, you know, some hardworking, dedicated freedom pioneers um, if that's going to happen. So at least that's my my own personal take on it. Yeah, I, I really hope, uh, at least I hope you see it in your lifetime. I'm probably a little bit too late for me. <laughs> but uh, I, I had a thought, um, it be kind of simple to do. Um, you know, there's so many aspects like you were going over earlier about um, uh, seasetting and, uh, and you know, mobile living and, and different avenues like that. If one were to kind of create a either a website or a YouTube uh, channel where they kind of collate these videos, you know, really well-made and uh, informational videos that were taken from, you know, say I've, I've seen several people with kind of van life type um, uh, videos. They're not directed towards VANU or, or voluntarism or anarchism, mm -hmm. but they have a great, you know, it's like a, it's like a place a person can go to get, be exposed to all these different things. Um, with a lot of instruction and a lot of uh, inspiration as well, without having to kind of search the entire, uh, um, 
I guess, YouTube universe, you know, kind of collate the the top ones or the best ones. I'm kind of just talking out my, my ass here now, but to me, it sounded like a good idea when I was thinking about it. <laughs> no, I, I, I like it, man. I, I definitely do. And, uh, and, and on that note, I, on that note too, um, yeah, like a, a lot of these folks, uh, whether they're the, the van nomads or the minimal sailboaters or, um, these people who just travel all the time. Um, I mean, uh, they may have different motivations for pursuing such, uh, pursuing such lifestyles, but, they are very close to, to, to Vaughnism. Um, they are very, very close to anarchism. Um, I, I really like they, they've already broken free from, um, um, as Ray would put it, the servile society. And they're now um, they've they've got these lifestyles where they have time, a lot of time to read, a lot of time to think. They've, they've got a lot more time than they ever had in their life. Uh, so uh, that's that's one thing I was really looking forward to as a Van Nomad is going to like uh, the Ripper Tramp Rendezvous, which would be another second realm, by the way. It's in a um, Quartzsite, Arizona, there's, I think there's like 4,000 van nomads there every year. Um, it's a huge van nomad meetup. Um, I mean, it would, it, I, I really think, you know, you have, I, I'm pretty sure I could, I could run through there and, uh, you know, just have, 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 you know, a couple, have some hour conversations with people and they'd be on board. Um, just, they just hadn't heard of Vani before. They might have not have heard of anarchism, but they're already, they're already living it. Right. So, um, yeah, right there with you. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll have to see, um, you know, how, how uh, things progress here, uh, it, it, at least to me. I was having a thought the other day about how kind of how dire everything was kind of looking and um, the, I guess the voluntarist uh, message just kind of seemed to be, uh, as I called it, a circle jerk and um, mm -hmm. didn't really seem like much was really happening but then i gotta tell myself that you know there are more and more um blogs being written there's more and more podcasts being put out and i mean in fact you know i decided only what a month ago to start doing this so mm -hmm. uh, it, i guess it's kind of a, a testament that you know everyone's work is not going you know it's not a, it's not a waste of time it's actually very valuable uh, oh so yeah it, it, it definitely is. It definitely is. And um, starting a pod, like wh whatever form of media it is, um, once uh, is a lot of, I mean, a lot of people's interactions with, with anarchism or Vani or whatever, well, not even really Vani, but we'll just say anarchism, um, you know, it's kind of like memes and statuses on Facebook. Um, but I, I really think the, the journey, the journey truly begins. Um, at least, at least in my, my experience is when you, when you start a podcast, a radio show, a, um, a blog, uh, something like that, and you really start to try to um, not just, I mean, because you might not have had a reason to do it before, but when you do a podcast, you're trying to get across your ideas. And in the process of doing that, you kind of weed out the bad ones, you, you find the really good ones, and you, you, you learn. It's, it's, it's a, I think it's a crucial step um, in just yep. personal development. So, um, like I said, don't, you know, Guys, for listeners, don't wait. If you're thinking about doing something like that, do, doing a podcast, blog, anything like that, um, just do it. It's super cheap to do nowadays. It, it definitely is. It doesn't cost very much at all. Um, barrier to entry is incredibly low. Um, yeah. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate you uh, being on. You've, uh, I mean, you've got a lot of information and you, you cover a lot of information. I, I really appreciate it. So uh, if you want to go ahead and tell our listeners how they can get a hold of you or see you or find your uh, resources, it'd be great. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, first off, thank you so much for, uh, for, for inviting me on. Uh, really, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I can be found. Uh, I'm still on Fascist Book and, uh, and Twitter. Um, LUA Truth on, uh, on Fascist Book, or you can just search for Liberty Attack Publications. Uh, and on Twitter, yeah, at LUA Radio. Um, pretty active on those platforms, um, but uh, you can find uh, um, you can find ways to purchase uh, purchase books, or if you're interested in publishing with us, uh, go to libertarianattack.com. Um, you can find uh, you can purchase directly from me, and of course I accept Bitcoin. I prefer Bitcoin, um, but a lot of folks want to purchase on Amazon, and that's fine with me. Uh, completely fine with me. Uh, so there are links to purchase uh, purchase on Amazon as well. I highly recommend you if you enjoyed the conversation that that that, that uh, we had today. Uh, you know, please do check out the Vani podcast. The podcast feed is uh, um, it's going to be updated more regularly now that I'm stationary. 
Uh, so uh, the pod- yeah, podcast will be, be updated, but uh, there's a, an exorbitant amount of resources um, there at uh, vonnypodcast.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, we talked about Darklands. Darklands.net's the website. It's not completely finished yet, but uh, I would recommend if you're interested in that project at all. We are looking for uh, developers, programmers, marketers, uh, community organizers, I guess, just anyone who's interested in helping this project come into fruition. Um, uh, you can find the white, pa- white paper at tinyurl.com forward slash darklands white paper. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's about it. And again, thank you so much for uh, for having me on. I, I really enjoy the conversation. It's nice to put a uh, put a voice to the uh, to, um, to the uh, I guess a voice to the Facebook messages. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, I'll include all of your information um, in the podcast, and I'll also throw it up on um, my uh, as you say, fascist book and mm-hmm. the, uh, the website. So, hey. Shane, once again, I really appreciate you being on. It was a great conversation. And if you ever have anything you want to talk about, you know, hey, you know, reach out to me and uh, we'll do it again. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.